Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, hello. My name is Gabby and welcome. So today's video is going to be about the disappearance of Jeremy Doland Bright, who was born May 25th, 1972. Jeremy Bright, a boy whose last name served him right. He was in fact a very bright kid. He loved drawing, basketball, and his sister Esty described him as having a mischievous side. He was a 14 year old who was born in Baltimore, Maryland, but at the time was living in Grants Pass, Oregon. In August of 1986 though, he was staying in Myrtle Point, a small city in Coos County, Oregon, with his stepfather and younger sister Esty. Myrtle Point was where Jeremy used to live most of his life before his mother and his stepfather Orville separated. For kids and even adults, going to the fair every year is something to look forward to. It's a fun time, just playing games and riding rides and indulging in cotton candy and hot dogs. It's, it's a fun place to be, and it's a place where you think nothing would really go wrong, but that's not always the case. On August 13th, somewhere between 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., Jeremy made a phone call to his mother, Diane, from a payphone to make plans for her to come and pick him and his sister up two days later on the 15th. He told her that he was having a great time at the fair. The Coos County Fair, the fair he attended, still to this day is a huge deal. Most everyone in the area makes it a plan to go when it's in town. Jeremy Bright was no exception. The main reason Jeremy and his little sister were staying at his stepfather's that week was because of the fair. They loved going, and it was a good opportunity for Jeremy to see friends he had left behind when he moved to Grants Pass. That day, he attended the fair with his friend, Johnny Fish. He had so much fun that he decided to go the next day, like most people did. A little before 10 p.m., he visited his stepfather and grandmother at a tavern his grandmother owned. This was a place his stepfather often hung out with his buddies to have a few drinks after work. Jeremy asked him if he could borrow some money to attend the fair the following day. His stepfather happily agreed. This would be the last time his stepfather or grandmother ever saw him. So August 14th, Jeremy was planning on attending the fair again, but this time he went with ST. They both decided to part ways around 2 p.m., go off, have fun on their own, and their plan was to meet back up at the Ferris wheel at 5 p.m. But he never showed. According to her, she saw her brother leave with two boys she didn't recognize. She said, for whatever reason, the officer I talked to didn't believe me. They thought I was making up a story to help out, but I had seen him leave with these people. He did. The next day, his mother arrived to his stepfather's home in Myrtle Point to pick up Jeremy and ST, and she was given the news that Jeremy is nowhere to be found. His mother said, I went in and on the TV set was his house keys from our Grants Pass apartment and his wallet and his new watch that he told me he'd bought. I knew when I found those things that he was around somewhere because he wouldn't leave without them. When another day passed and Jeremy was still nowhere to be found and nobody had heard from him, they decided to notify the Myrtle Point Police Department. At first, I was a little bit confused with the time gap. There is a couple days that had went by before they did notify the police, but I guess it was mostly because the fair was in town and Jeremy had a lot of friends in the area that he wanted to visit, so I'm guessing that his stepfather and sister kind of figured that's what he was off doing and that he'd be home in a few days. Then when they realized that nobody had really seen him, nobody had heard from him, they knew that something was wrong and that's when they decided to finally notify the police. Jeremy's family was extremely frustrated because the first few days can be crucial when it comes to finding a missing person. And when they first notified police, the police chief told them not to worry that when the fair packed everything up and moved on to the next town, after everything calmed down, he'll definitely show up. But that is not what happened. After the fair left town on the 17th of that month and there was still no sign of Jeremy anywhere, the police suspected foul play. Then the family became more frustrated because on August 23rd, the department announced they are no longer suspecting foul play involved in this case because there were supposed sightings of Jeremy around the town. Law enforcement told the family they suspected that Jeremy possibly ran away with the carnival. As mischievous as he was though, this is something his family knew he would never do. 
Then about three months after his disappearance, the Coos County Police Department took over the case and they themselves could not believe how the previous department had handled the case. Sergeant Steve Dalton was put on the case and he did not believe for a second that this teenager would run away. Detective Craig Zanny handled the case as well, trying to figure out what happened to Jeremy and attempt to piece together the events that led up to his disappearance. This is one of those cases where the theories and the rumors greatly outweigh the actual evidence that we have. And this was a small town. Everybody talked, everybody wanted to be included, everybody wanted to have their own story to bring forth. Some of it was true, some of it was completely just made up. That's what happened with this case. So let's get into a few of the theories now. The first theory places Jeremy at a Myrtle Point party the night that he disappeared. As the rumor goes, instead of staying at the fair the day of the 14th, he left to attend a party with some friends. At this party, he decided to drink some beer. That the beer was laced with an illegal drug and because Jeremy had a heart murmur, it caused him to fatally overdose not long after ingesting it. That everyone at the party saw what happened and agreed to dispose of his body somewhere and to never tell a soul what happened. This theory is not super far-fetched. It's not completely unbelievable. It is something that could have happened, but there's really no proof. So police kind of just moved on from this theory. While that first theory was circulating, another one started circulating, and this one was brought up by a prisoner who went to the police and told them that they know what happened to Jeremy. This one tells how Jeremy was at a swimming hole with some friends when three older boys started a fight with him and used him as target practice. The three older boys had been shooting in the area and one shot Jeremy after a quarrel broke out. That the three boys took Jeremy up to a cabin in the woods to try to nurse him back to health when he succumbed to his injuries and passed away. So they decided to bury him in a shallow grave on the property. Police, of course, did take this story seriously. They had to. So they went to the cabin, they searched the cabin, they searched the ground, they searched into the forest, and they found nothing. As time went on, more and more theories and rumors and speculations started popping up and everybody in this small town was kind of pointing fingers at each other. The next one comes from Cecilia Fish, the sister to Johnny Fish, the boy who went to the fair with Jeremy on the 13th, Jeremy's best friend. Cecilia told police how she was staying the night of the 14th at her older sister's apartment and that when they left the apartment around midnight, her and her sister spotted someone wandering the streets in the distance who was covered in blood. Who exactly was this bloody person though? Well, it kind of connects to our next theory. The last theory that I'm going to be talking about is definitely the most believed. It's the one that most people are drawn to as being what actually happened. And it's a theory that came up a few years later. According to several accounts, the last time Jeremy was seen was when he was in the car with a fellow young man. This man's name was Terry Steinhoff. It wouldn't be completely odd for Jeremy to be seen in this man's car because they did know each other. Terry and his sister used to babysit Jeremy when he was younger. In early 1989, Jeremy's case was featured on Unsolved Mysteries and not long after, Terry Steinhoff was arrested for the stabbing of a 32-year-old woman named Patricia Morris and was given life in prison. This further fueled people's suspicions that he may have been involved in Jeremy's disappearance three years earlier. When it came to Jeremy, Terry knew that there was nothing police could do if he didn't incriminate himself. In 2007, when they were going to question Steinhoff again about Jeremy's disappearance, he died of a heroin overdose in prison. So theory three and theory four kind of go hand in hand because Cecilia Fish, she wrote on a message board a few years back saying, I believe that Johnny was there and witnessed whatever happened to Jeremy. Johnny was never the same after that night. I believe that Johnny was threatened with his family being next if he ever told. I tried many times to get Johnny to remember, but he couldn't. 
He has been a mental case ever since that night. I think something happened to him also, but he has suppressed it so deep in his mind he can't tell what happened to them that night. I wish someone would tell what happened. It was David Steinhoff that I ran into that night, and he was covered in blood. I don't think he was in a fight. There was too much blood for that. David Steinhoff is Terry Steinhoff's cousin. And it's also quite odd that ST says that she saw Jeremy leave with two unknown men. Possibly these two men were David and Terry, and possibly they went off with Jeremy, something happened, and they were involved in Jeremy's disappearance. This is a huge theory in this case. Apparently Johnny arrived to his older sister's apartment not long after Cecilia and her saw David bloody wandering the streets and Johnny was very shaken up and he wouldn't tell what happened. Johnny from my research went down a very bad path and he ultimately passed away in 2011. Terry Steinhoff would not discuss Jeremy's disappearance with police. He absolutely refused. So after he passed away in 2007, police figured that maybe somebody who was afraid to come forward before would finally come forward with new information because Terry had passed away. But that didn't happen. Just like every family that I discuss on my channel, Jeremy's family really did try to move on the best that they could while also, of course, keeping his memory alive. Jeremy's grandmother passed away in 1988. That same year, four of Jeremy's friends all died in a car accident. Jeremy's father passed away in 2003, and Jeremy's biological father passed away in 2008. All of these people passed away never knowing what happened to Jeremy. His sister believes someone in the town of Myrtle Point knows something, somebody who is still walking around today, and she just hopes that they have the courage to ever come forward with the truth. For his mother, the rumors were very difficult to handle, saying, all of them are hard to think about. Every time I'd hear a new one, I have nightmares for a week or so. The one that I hope is not what happened is one where he suffered for two weeks before he died and they buried his body because the thought of him suffering for two weeks just makes me sick. In 2016, which was only three years ago, police received a tip that Jeremy's body may be in a pond. They searched this pond the best that they could and they found nothing though. As of right now, this case is still open, but police and his family have basically come to the conclusion that he is dead. His family just hopes and prays that somebody will come forward with some new information, somebody who's been holding it inside all these years, and they'll finally just get the courage and tell police what happened. Jeremy Bright at the time of his disappearance had brown hair and green eyes. He was six feet tall and weighed about 140 pounds. He had a scar on his forehead, a scar on his nose, and a mole on his chin. He was last seen wearing a black windbreaker jacket, a red tank top, and black size 13 Nike shoes with red shoelaces. If you have any information regarding his disappearance, you are urged to call the Coos County Police Department at 541-396-7800. You can stay anonymous. After this many years, it seems like somebody would be willing to say something, as Dee told World News, even if it was just to say where Jeremy is, even if they called it in anonymously and said, this is where he is, this is where you can find him. To live with that knowledge for 20 years and not say anything has got to be torture. So that is the case of Jeremy Bright. Now, most people online that I came across who had an opinion about this case do believe that Terry and David Steinhoff were involved in Jeremy's disappearance. There are so many theories and especially rumors when it comes to this case, but I really tried to focus on the main ones in this video because some of them are just very, very far-fetched. I have to say that I 100 billion percent agree with Jeremy's sister ST when she says that there's probably somebody still walking around Myrtle Point who knows what happened to her brother. I believe that wholeheartedly. I think it's somebody or a group of people 
who kept their mouth shut because this was a small town and if you tell somebody outside of your circle or tell somebody else, word travels very fast and I feel like it would have eventually gotten out. So I think that whatever happened was kind of kept on lockdown, which I can't even imagine how that must be for his remaining family who lives in the area or visits the area, a place that they know everybody and just going to the supermarket or going to the park and thinking, hey, like that person over there, that person could know what happened to my brother or my son. And that just must be complete mental torture. I believe in coincidences. Obviously, there are a lot of coincidences when it comes to the cases that I discussed, but I just think it's too ironic that David Steinhoff is walking around with blood on him the night that a boy disappears. That's just, they, there has to be some connection there. They have presumed Jeremy Bright as deceased. They believe that he was in fact murdered. And if he was murdered, I think his body, and a lot of people believe this also, that his body is still in Myrtle Point. It's just, where is it? And like I said, I can't imagine living with that and I hope that his family one day can finally have peace when it comes to this. Like always with all of my videos, make sure to leave kind comments down below because you never know what family members may come across this video. Make sure to also leave recommendations for videos that you want me to do. I try to read every single comment. And with all that being said, I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.